Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. This is the post-game podcast. The Timberwolves defeated the Dallas Mavericks on Sunday by six points, extending the Timberwolves' win streak to four games. It was a shorthanded Mavericks team with, of course, no Luka Doncic, among others, but it was a shorthanded Wolves team with no Anthony Edwards. We're going to break down the win in this one, including Jalen Noel's huge second half, massive third quarter, Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell's strong play down the stretch, and uh, key takeaways as well as individual studs and duds, as we always do on the post-game pod. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. I'm also the editor of Dunkin' with Wolves, the Timberwolves site on the Fan Sided Network. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Check out prizepicks.com and use promo code NBA or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Happy Monday, everybody. This is the post game podcast from the Timberwolves' victory of the Dallas Mavericks on Sunday night at Target Center. It was the Timberwolves' fourth game in a row that they've won. We're going to break it all down on the show here today. We're going to do key takeaways as well as individual studs and duds. First of all, though, thank you for making Locked on Wolves your first listen each and every day. And remember, Locked on Wolves is free and available on every single platform you could possibly think of. That includes YouTube, as well as all your favorite audio platforms from Apple to Google, as well as Spotify and the all-new Odyssey app. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked on T-Wolves and at my account, which is at Beacon with two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. All right, as mentioned, this was the fourth consecutive win. Um, sure, caveats apply. The Dallas Mavericks were shorthanded. I get that. They were missing five, depending on how you feel about the rotation on any given day. Six rotation players, of course, Luka Doncic and Reggie Bullock being the, the most significant uh, absences from the Mavericks rotation. It's also important to note that Chris Epps Porzingis only played 23 minutes. He he tweaked, uh, I think he had a foot injury, sore foot or something, uh, is what they announced in the third quarter um, and only played 23 minutes. He, he was really only effective in getting to the free throw line. He was nine or nine at the line in this game, had 13 points when he went out, but just three rebounds obviously impacted the game, him going down in a game that the Wolves only won by six points. Um, so no Doncic, only half a game of Porzingis, no Bullock, no, you know, handful of other guys as well, but the Timberwolves didn't have Anthony Edwards. The Timberwolves also didn't have Torian Prince, Josh Kogi. Typically only one of those two guys would be in the rotation anyway. So the Wolves were missing like basically one and a half rotation players, but arguably their second best player overall was missing too. So. Um, Certainly, the Wolves should have won this game. They also didn't play. It was far from a perfect game for, for either team. But this game was important for a number of reasons. Obviously, extending the winning streak. Obviously, winning both games at home on this short homestand. Uh, you know, uh, it, But also, the Wolves entered this game a half game behind the Mavericks in the Western Conference standings. They're now a half game ahead of Dallas. And uh, you know they play them again on Tuesday. So obviously, at any time you can get a, a game up in these potential tiebreaker situations against teams that are in your same kind of realm in the Western conference. And at this stage, you know, I think everyone expected Dallas to be a lot better than the wolves this year, but right now they're both going to kind of bounce between the six and 10 or 11 spots in the West. It looks like, so this matters that the wolves are able to win. If they can steal the win in Dallas on Tuesday and win five straight, then they'll have a significant leg up on Dallas when it comes to a potential tiebreaker down the road, uh, when it's all said and done. So all that to say, this was a, a fun game. Uh, Minnesota was up a couple at the end of the first quarter. They were up six at halftime. Um, and the offense wasn't really all that great early for Minnesota. It was, it was pretty sloppy. There were some, you know, for the game, Minnesota only had nine turnovers, but there were some pretty careless mistakes. some just kind of silly mistakes, uh, that happened really throughout the game, but especially early and things just kind of weren't clicking. Uh, thankfully they weren't really for the Mavs either. And each team kind of went on these mini runs. It was a little bit back and forth, but Minnesota kind of was able to, Every time Dallas got to within a point or tie it, you know, Minnesota would extend the lead up to six and then it would come back closer and then it would be eight. And Minnesota like slowly and methodically extended their lead. But Dallas was in this thing the entire time. Uh, generally, the Timberwolves played good defense in this game. They gave up, what, 105 points. They gave up 43.9% uh, shooting. You can live with that 29%, 29.3 to be precise from outside the arc for Dallas. They did commit a lot of fouls and Dallas was phenomenal. They made their first 21 free throws in this game and were 21 to 22 overall. Uh, but for the most part, the defense was good. Minnesota was only a minus four on the glass against a team that easily could have out rebounded them. Um, and to me, the biggest thing was 
the perimeter defense was solid. Minnesota, for the most part, the on-ball defense, the point of attack defense was good. They were fighting through screens. They were switching when needed on the perimeter. And the the only lapses really came in the paint, uh, as we've seen so often over, you know, I guess now they're on this four-game winning streak. But the first part of this winning streak and going back to the the losing streak that immediately preceded this, this ongoing winning streak now, a lot of lapses with the low man. Uh, Timberwolves not getting either the low man not stepping up to where he needs to be or not stepping up at all or getting the wrong person down there that just can't really hold their own. That happened a little bit with Anthony Edwards at times, um, you know, a, a few games ago. But in this game, there were a couple of instances where the low man just wasn't quite in the right spot and the Timberwolves gave up some dunks that they they frankly should not have given up. Um, should never just give up wide open dunks. And there were a few too many of those in this game, but they defended the three point line fairly well for the most part. Um, as mentioned, Dallas was under 30% from three and they're not a great three point shooting team. I think they were 25th in the league in percentage coming into this game in some way, similar to Minnesota and that they shoot a bunch of them. They were fifth in the league in, in attempts per game from outside the arc, but 25th in makes the wolves, I think are first and 22nd in makes and, or excuse me, attempts at percentage uh, respectively. So the Mavs aren't a great three point shooting team, but Minnesota did a pretty good job of chasing them off the line where possible, contesting three-point attempts, uh, closing out for the most part under control. There were some, you know, D'Angelo Russell's known to occasionally close out a little too aggressively and then get beaten off the dribble for an easy mid-range jumper or, or just penetration that leads to a bucket. Um, but for the most part, Minnesota's defense was aggressive. They were under control. They did a good enough job on the glass. They made life difficult in the paint. They only had three block shots in this game. And if you you told me that we'll talk more about your advantage but later, but that he only had one steal and one block and 10 rebounds, I would have told you you were crazy. I would have doubled all those numbers. It felt like he had 18, 20 rebounds in this game and two, three, four steals and blocks. But um, at any rate, it was just the activity of the Timberwolves defense that that almost created that illusion. It felt like Minnesota had a bunch more steals and blocks, and it felt like Dallas created more than or, or committed more than 10 turnovers in this game. Minnesota's defense was good enough. And then down the stretch after Dallas had a big third quarter and was actually up a couple points heading to the fourth, um, Jalen Noel kind of brid third bridging into the fourth quarter had a really strong stint. And we'll talk more about him here in just a minute. But down the stretch, Minnesota did just enough. Uh, there was a big D'Angelo Russell on the perimeter with the Wolves up three in the final minute. Uh, felt pressure. I forget who the defender was. Did the rip through move in the, in the bonus. He got the free throws uh, based on being in the bonus and he extended the lead to five. And then when the Mavs missed on the other end, they got a big rebound from Carl Anthony Towns. who only had again, just seven boards in this game, but it was a monster rebound to basically seal the game at that point. Um, so good enough offensive execution down the stretch. There were some, a couple of stagnant moments where Dilo wanted to be the guy and, and did the thing where he just kind of shoots the ball in isolation without ever passing it, which is great when he's really hot, which he was for, for stretches in the third quarter. But down the stretch, there were a couple of possessions that were just a little bit uh, clunky for Minnesota, but they did enough defensively. And again, putting the game away with defensive rebounds um, and then D'Lo obviously drawing that foul and hitting those free throws in the final minute was enough to put this game away, regardless of the offensive clunkiness that we saw really kind of throughout this one, especially early and then for stretches of the fourth quarter as Dallas made their comeback. Or I should say, as Dallas uh, had already made their comeback and was holding a little bit of a lead early in the fourth quarter. Um, so next, what I want to do is I want to get into key takeaways. I've got, I guess, kind of four that I want to dig in on a little bit before we get to individual studs and duds. So we're going to do that next. First, though, let's talk about our friends at Truebill. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a, it's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts, and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in just one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there whenever you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so that you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and has helped save them over $100 million. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now to Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Let's talk key takeaways from this one. Um, number one, the rotation is is uh, extremely notable, and then along with this, Jalen Noel. So first, the rotation in general, uh, with no Josh Okogie, no Torian Prince, obviously no Anthony Edwards, bumps Malik Beasley to the starting lineup, means Jade McDaniels is effectively your sixth man at this point, and he played fantastic, by the way. He only had one rebound in 32 minutes, but besides that, he was great defensively, five of eight shooting, hit a couple of big three-pointers. Um, and was really good. Nas Reed was solid. Jalen Noel saw a little bit of time in the first half, along with Leandro Balmaro, 
And then Balmaro didn't see the court in the second half at all. He only played two minutes in the first half. Noel uh, saw extensive time third into the fourth quarter and was really good. So the Wolves only played nine guys in this game and uh, eight of them played 18 or more minutes with Balmaro's two minutes. He was the only one um, that, that played under 18 minutes that saw the floor. Jake Lehman didn't play after getting rotation minutes on uh, on Friday night. And Jordan McLaughlin didn't play again, too. He's kind of been relegated to that uh, DNP CD role uh, almost every night now. And the backup point guard minutes were handled primarily by Patrick Beverly and for brief stretches, Jalen Noel handled some offense as well. And, and D'Lo and Beverly played off the ball. Um, so interestingly interesting in that the Wolves didn't have a de facto backup point guard, right? Both Beverly and Russell have been in the starting lineup with no regular ball. Morrow minutes who'd been handling some backup quote unquote backup point guard minutes a week or two ago. Um, the rotation continues to tighten. And obviously that's by necessity in this game with, with Noah Kogi, no Prince and no Edwards. Uh, but still, you know, uh, Finch could have gone with Jordan McLaughlin. He could have done things a little bit differently, but instead he kind of, he kind of turned some of those reins over to Jalen Noel and Noel's third quarter was phenomenal. Um, he had a couple of open threes. One was in transition. One was in the half court. He had a couple of nice mid range jumpers. He scored in the paint, a well-rounded game for Jalen Noel, 16 points on six of nine shooting in 18 minutes, four rebounds, three assists, no turnovers. He was a plus six in 18 minutes, which was tied for the third best mark on the team in terms of individual plus minus. And I, if you're a regular listener, if you've listened to the show going back, you know, a year and a half or so, I'm a big Jalen Noel fan. I think he is a, a rotation player on a playoff team in this league. All he needed to do is show that he could play a little bit of defense and, and stay on the floor that way. He's shot the three well in college. He shot the three well in the G League. And he started to shoot the ball well finally outside the arc in the end at the NBA level last year. That's been his biggest issues, consistency from beyond the arc at the NBA level and just generally defense. We know he can score. We know he can score at all three levels. We know he has an outstanding handle for a guy who generally plays off the ball. And he can initiate offense as well. We saw that a little bit in Las Vegas Summer League where the Wolves asked him to work on that. And I, I mean, it's I understand why he doesn't play more because who are you going to take minutes away from? I mean, oftentimes the Wolves have so many guys that are skewed their games are skewed towards offense that you need defensive guys like Josh Kogi and guys who can theoretically be a three and D player like a Torian Prince. So Noel gets squeezed out of the rotation, but if he can at least compete defensively, a la say D'Angelo Russell this year uh, or Malik Beasley at times this year has been able to compete defensively. He can do essentially what Malik Beasley is supposed to do um, that in theory. Right. And at, by the way, at a much lower cost too. Right. And with the way Beasley's played for most of the season, then he was okay in this game, but for the way Beasley's played for much of the season, I mean, wouldn't you just as soon have Jalen Noel out there? And, and I'm not necessarily advocating for him taking over Beasley's role. Um, obviously this team's winning right now, so just keep doing what you're doing. But, um, Noel is a rotation player. If he can play a lick of defense, he is an NBA rotation player. He can score at all three levels. He can be efficient. He's uh, He can operate the pick and roll extremely well. He can be a spot-up shooter. He can shoot off the bounce. He can score in transition. He's athletic enough. He can dribble well enough. Um, and this was a great example of that in, in this game. Um, so that's my first takeaway is the unique rotation and also Noel competing defensively because I thought point of attack-wise, he was pretty solid when he was on the ball handler third quarter, early fourth quarter in this game. Another takeaway that I think could easily get lost in this one is D'Angelo Russell, again, had a really solid game. Um, you know, he's not dropping 35. He's not jacking up 12 threes. He's not doing anything that's going to make him, you know, the headline, uh, you know, in the highlights on NBA TV or whatever. Um, it's just another solid game. 22 points. He only had three assists and two rebounds in this game, but only one turnover, eight of 16 shooting, a nice 50% from the field. Better than 50% from three, four of seven outside the arc. This is an efficient, solid game. Second leading scorer on the team. It's exactly what you want to see out of D'Angelo Russell. He's not trying to be the guy too much. He did a little bit in the fourth, but that was, it was fine, obviously, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't use up multiple possessions in a row. He tried to pick his spots and he was piping hot in the third quarter. He had a, a couple of possessions where he was dropping in mid-range jumpers and a couple of three-pointers that barely rippled the net. And when he gets hot like that, you just kind of give him the keys and say, hey, this, this thing's yours for right now, D'Lo. Um, and the fourth quarter wasn't quite as good for him, but he hit a couple of big free throws. His only two free throw attempts of the game were basically to kind of salt the game away there late. Um, or I should say, really, they were more important than that. It was pushing the lead from three to five in the final minute after that rip through move on the left wing. Um, D'Lo had another solid game. It's going to get overlooked. It's not going to get talked about a ton. Um, it's not going to make a ton of highlights, but this is the D'Angelo Russell, the solid, you know, above average, really good score, solid defender, 
D'Angelo Russell. It's not probably all-star Brooklyn Nets D'Angelo Russell, but it doesn't need to be. If Anthony Edwards, especially if Anthony Edwards is healthy and if Carl Anthony Towns is what he can be, D'Angelo Russell just needs to be a really good player. And he has been that over the last several games and really for much of the season now, or at least the, I guess, minus the first 10 days or so of the season. He's just been a really solid player. And that's exactly what the Wolves need. Uh, my third thing is another mostly under control game from Carl Anthony Towns. He got, he was a little sloppy at times for him. He had a couple bad turnovers, bad passes. Um, I don't think he had any offensive fouls, but he had two, three bad passes overall, four turnovers in this game. He did commit five fouls overall, um, uh, fouled a three point shooter, which wasn't great, but 24 points, seven rebounds, six assists, one steal was a plus six in 34 minutes, six of 15 shooting only one of three outside the arc, but the three he made, was big. It was when the Mavs were hanging around in the fourth quarter. It was actually, I think right after a possession where D'Lo dribbled out the clock and shot jacked up a long three pointer. The very next possession, the offense was looking a little stagnant again. They were trying to get into something, and Towns had, uh, I forget who it was. I think it might have been Jalen Brunson on him. Straight away, outside the arc, straight on with the hoop, which is where we know Towns likes to shoot him, but probably from 29, 30 feet, and just drained it. Um, and that was his only three-point make of the game, but he was 11 of 13 at the free throw line, was aggressive in the paint, really kind of worked through early in the game, Porzingis, but also Dwight Powell just kind of went through them at the rim and was really good. I mean... You'll take 24, seven and six with, uh, you know, 13 free throw attempts, 11 free throw makes for towns. He had two misses in the fourth that were weird, but other than that, he was perfect from the line. Um, this was a really, a really solid cat game. He was again, mostly under control. There were a couple of small outbursts where he felt like a foul should have been called, but generally speaking, this is what you need to see out of Carl Anthony towns. And then my last thing is Jared Vanderbilt. Um, and, and I guess I'm kind of tipping off some of my individual studs and duds here for next segment, but Vando, again, not a really sexy line. And I mentioned this earlier that it felt like he had twice as many rebounds, steals, and blocks that he actually had in this game. He had 10 rebounds, one steal, one block, but he was phenomenal. He was everywhere. His one block was, was an awesome block at the rim from behind. Um, he was three of four shooting the ball. So, he, you know, he had a couple of nice dunks in the paint. He had a, an alley-oop uh, that he converted early in the game. He played a team high 38 minutes. Chris Finch has talked about this frequently before. You, you just feel like you can't take him off the floor because he's that important to win. He impacts winning that much uh, on both ends of the floor. And, and yeah, he's he's not a good offensive player in terms of he's not. You don't want him with the ball in space. You don't. You're not going to post him up. You don't really want him with the ball outside the arc. Although he's okay in transition, he doesn't have good hands. But if he can play the part, be in the dunker spot in the right time roll at the at the right time knock down a corner three every couple of games to keep defenses honest enough and then when given the opportunity get to the rim make free throws when he's fouled he didn't do that in this game he was over two at the line but if he does some of those different things offensively that can offset his shortcomings and just be himself on defense and in transition he had his steal was uh he snuck up on i actually think this was brunson as well snuck up on him you know just when he crossed the timeline and got a steal started a fast break the other way he tries you know, doing that or ambushing the inbounds pass after a make in the backcourt at least once, twice a game. Um, and that's classic Jared Vanderbilt. This was another one of those games where just, I mean, there's a reason why I talked about him as a winning player when they traded for him 18 months ago is the steal of that Denver Nuggets trade. And, and last week I had a show where I compared him to Dennis Rodman, which sounds crazy when you say it, but there is a Rodman like impact that he can have on the game. Um, and we saw that again here against the Mavs. Okay, I want to finish the show by looking at individual studs and duds. So we're going to do that next. First, though, let's talk about our friends over at Built Bar. This holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar, or even better than a candy bar. Legitimately, there's at least a couple of flavors that taste better than the vast majority of candy bars that are out there. Candy bars, not protein bars. Built Bar is filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, covered in chocolate, but amazingly low in calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat, and high in protein. You get the best of both worlds, delicious and healthy. Built Bar gives you that extra fuel you need to bust down those mall doors and battle all the holiday shoppers. Or if you're just standing in endless shopping lines, Built Bar can give you that extra something to keep you going. So throw it in your jacket or your purse. You never know when you're going to need it. Want to cozy up with something warm? Here's a holiday secret. Dip your Built Bar into a piping hot cup of cocoa. Let it melt just a little. Give your beverage a little bit of that Built Bar flavor. Plus, you'll have a nice melty Built Bar to go with it. If you like some of those marshmallow treats around the holidays, you got to get your hands on Built Bar Puffs. They're light, fluffy, and marshmallow through and through. Different flavors, all covered in chocolate. Tastes so good, you won't believe that they're filled with protein. Go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15. You'll get 15% off your order. Again, that's Built.com. Promo code LOCK15, you'll get 15% off your order. Let's also talk about BetOnline.ag. 
Bet Online has you covered all season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Football seasons continue their march to the playoffs. Basketball season is now more than a third of the way over. And Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today. Receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code locked on to receive your bonus. Again, promo code locked on to get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit from basketball to football, NHL to boxing and UFC right on down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 and 2022 seasons. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports bet online where the game starts. All right, we're going to close this one down with individual studs and duds. Uh, not too hard to figure in this game for Minnesota. Um, Number one for me in this game overall is going to have to be Carl Anthony Towns. Again, under control game for Cat. 24 points, seven rebounds, six assists. He did have the four turnovers. He pitched in a steal, six of 15 shooting, one of three outside the arc, 11 of 13 at the line. He did so much damage down low early and at the free throw line, really, um, that it kind of set the tone for the entire game. He made things difficult for Dwight Powell, made things difficult for Chris Porzingis. Porzingis. Uh, uh, Maxi Kleber had his opportunities to guard Towns. And Towns has just been kind of on another level the last few games where he's just been locked in. He obviously took on the Jokic challenge last Wednesday. He took on the Anthony Davis challenge and passed with flying cover colors on Friday. So Towns is just in his zone right now. And if he can just kind of stay there, and the I mean, the Wolves should beat Dallas on Tuesday. If he plays like this, the team plays like this, and hopefully maybe a little bit better, a little less sloppy on Tuesday. But um, if Cat can just do his thing, um, then then, I mean, we're looking at potentially another all-star season and he hasn't been there to the all-star game now in a couple of years. So um, he just needs to keep playing like he has been here the last week. Plus uh, second for me is Jalen Noel, 16 points on six of nine shooting, hit both of his three point attempts, both of his free throw attempts. He dropped his 16 points on nine total shots in just 18 minutes, four rebounds, three assists, zero turnovers, and uh, was a plus six in 18 minutes. Talked a lot about him earlier, but love Jalen Noel. He can, he can, he can, you know, be your off ball guy. He can play the two, but he can also initiate some offense. He can knock down open shots, score at all three levels. All that stuff was on display in this game. And he definitely earned himself rotation minutes. Hopefully Anthony Edwards can play Tuesday. If he plays Tuesday, um, you know, I don't see why, you know, Joshua Kogi or Torian Prince, if they're available, should take Noel's minutes away from him. I don't see why Balmaro should get minutes ahead of Noel at this point, especially if the rest of the team is defending well enough. You can give back a little bit there to get the offense, the extra punch off the bench that Noel can provide. Now, of course, Malik Beasley would bump back to the bench. He started as just the second game of the year uh, against the Mavs. When Ed Edwards comes back, Beasley goes back to the bench, but I don't think that precludes Noel from getting minutes. I think he would still need to be part of this rotation and, and kind of try and be that microwave off the bench, if you will, that microwave scorer. Third stud for me in this game. I guess this one's a little bit more difficult. I'll go with D'Angelo Russell, 22 points on eight of 16 shooting, four of seven outside the arc, hit those two big free throws late, three assists, two rebounds, of course, you'd like to see your point guard have more than three assists, but he was good in this game. And and obviously, Patrick Beverly initiated some offense, too. Um, so good game from D'Angelo Russell. Talked a lot about him before, but just another solid, steady game. Not a stud or a dud, but I got to shout out Patrick Beverly. Ten points, eight rebounds, four assists, two blocks, and a steal. Only got up six shots in this game. It was just two of six. But he attempted six free throws. Again, 10, 8, and 4 with a couple of blocks and a steal. Team best plus 11 in the plus minus category. Another just vintage Pat Bev game where he's just a monster defensively and, and can help you out on the glass. He was the second leading rebounder on the team after Vanderbilt out rebounded towns in this game. Uh, the, the wolves have gotten better on the glass as the season has gone on, by the way, coming into this game, Minnesota was out of 30th place in defensive rebounding percentage for the first time since the first week of the season. They're now in 29th and that percentage has been inching its way up towards 74%, I think is around where it is now coming into the Mavs game and Beverly and Russell and the, and the point guards kind of, kind of crashing in and helping support the rebounding effort has been a big part of that. Pat Bev had that on display on Sunday against the Mavs. I also want to shout out uh, Malik Beasley. He only had 13 points. He was only four of 13 shooting, but he played a solid game. Uh, this was, this was a second consecutive solid game for Malik Beasley. He missed his first, I think he was maybe missed two out of his first four attempts from outside the arc, but then went on a small string where he hit some in a row and had five assists, zero turnovers in this game. You know, you'd like to see him shoot better than 33% from outside the arc over the course of a game. You'd like to see him get more than one rebound, but he was solid defensively, five assists, no turnovers, and, you know, hit a couple of big shots when he needed to. So another good game from Malik, and it, it's it's very good to see that. Um, in terms of duds, 
it, it's really hard to, to pick a dud in this game. Across the board, the Wolves actually played fairly well. Um, so I'm, I'm just not going to. Um, I talked about Jaden McDaniels had a good game off the bench. Nas was fine. He was solid. You know, had a couple assists, couple steals in 21 minutes, which we don't always see out of Nas. Balmaro only played two minutes, didn't do anything notable um, on either end of the floor. So there really isn't a dud in this game. This was just one of those games. The Wolves didn't play great. It was kind of a slog. Uh, the defense had those lapses at the rim. The offense was sloppy early. They missed. Uh, the shooting was okay, but getting into the offense was, again, slog is probably the best term. It was just sloppy. Um, you look up and there's, if you didn't watch the game, you'd be like, ah, nine turnovers, you know, 44% from three. Yeah, it wasn't quite that pretty. The offense was was a little messy. Um, but they won by six. They did enough things good defensively. Uh, they did enough things on the glass. They got to the free throw line a bunch. They shot threes well enough. Uh, they were pretty good in transition, even without Anthony Edwards, that you got to feel good. These are the types of games that the Wolves teams of the past would not generally win. And I'm not using this to signify that, hey, this team has arrived or anything like that. But these are the types of games that Timberwolves fans are used to seeing their team lose. And they were able to hold on and win by a couple of possessions against, uh, even though it's it was a shorthanded Mavs team, it's still a decent Mavs team. They were half game ahead of the Wolves coming into this one. So now the Wolves go into the ma matchup on Tuesday, same team in Dallas with a chance to put, uh, I guess, a game's worth of distance between the two teams, which would be really nice to do as the schedule continues to be difficult for the rest of the calendar month for Minnesota. All right, that's all we have for today. We'll be back, of course, on Tuesday uh, with Tuesday's show. We'll preview Wolves Mavs Tuesday night and, uh, and uh, of course, all week, Monday through Friday, regular shows. Um, and uh, as we get later in the week, I'll talk a little bit about what to expect over the, the holiday weekend here upcoming in terms of show schedule. Uh, but we'll break all that down. Make sure that if you're not already following or subscribed to the show that you do so. Thank you to those of you that do make Lockdown Wolves your first listen each and every day. A reminder that we're free and available on all platforms that includes YouTube, as well as all the audio platforms like Apple, Google, Spotify, and of course, also Odyssey. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. That's all we have for today. Thanks once again for listening to Lockdown Wolves, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Remember, the Locked On Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Locked On Wolves Podcast, and we'll catch you next time.